Welcome to another episode of Culinary School Stories, the weekly podcast that is dedicated to sharing the stories of people around the globe whose lives have been influenced, impacted, touched, and or enriched, for good or for bad, from their culinary school experience. Hi, my name is Colin Roach and I'm your host. Thanks for joining us today. You are an important part of this show where we ask the question, what's your culinary school story? So now, without any further delay, let's meet today's guest. Hello, everyone, and thank you for listening in today to another episode of the Culinary School Stories podcast, a proud member of the Food Media Network. And if you haven't yet subscribed to the podcast, please do so. It's free and can be done through your favorite podcast app or at www.culinaryschoolstories.com. And so without any further delay, I would now like to introduce today's guest, Chef Colleen Grapes. Colleen, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, so let's start like any good story at the beginning. Where did your love of food come <laughs> from? Where did that love of cooking start? And how did that develop into going to culinary school? I know. I, I was one of those people when I was a, a junior in, in high school. I still had no idea what I wanted to do. And it's a big ask and a big thing to think of what you want to do for the rest of your life, which we know now those things can change. <laughs> yes. um, at first, actually, when I was in high school, um, I really I was actually a, uh, an aerobics instructor and used to teach semi-professional weightlifting, which I absolutely loved. Wow. Um, and then I noticed every time that I would come home from work, I would bake. And turns out, you know, years down the road, I found out because when you're doing those things, you rid your body of the natural sugars. So I would go home and bake all the time. I'd be making apple turnovers. Um, you know, I was very proud of my English muffin pizzas at that point <laughs> and <laughs> always making cookies. Um, and a little bit of a backstory to that even is uh, I was able to know two of my great grandmothers and I actually used to bake with them a lot. And my grandmothers used to bake a whole lot. So it was something that I had always done. But when it came down to thinking what I really wanted to do, I wanted to go into the more the more the healthier aspect of it. Um, and a friend of mine had suggested going to culinary school, which was something that I had never thought of before. Doing a little bit of research, I found out that Johnson & Wales had a what they consider like a, a weekend. You go to try it out for the weekend to see if you liked it. Mm -hmm. And I went for the weekend and I absolutely loved it. And I knew that that's what I wanted to do. Um, and then specifically, I really was very much into art at that time as well and decided to take a little bit of that aspect of art and actually go into specifically pastry. Great. So you, you were a weightlifter in high school that burned up calories. You went home and you baked. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's where you love of mm -hmm. baking. Is, does, did you study baking at Johnson & Wales? Yes, specifically actually studied baking at Johnson & Wales, but then my I would come, I would actually was from, I'm from New Jersey. Um, I would go home on the weekends and work my regular job because there we only went to school, as you know, Monday through Monday through Thursday, because we were expected to be working Fridays for the weekends. And so I would drive home Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and I was actually doing culinary. I was working at a place called the High Lawn Pavilion. In, uh, on Eagle Rock Reservation in uh, New Jersey. And then the gentleman who was my chef at that point had received a book or had, it was as a gift, and it was called um, Al Forno. Um, and it turns out that he called them, unbe completely unbeknownst to me, because he knew that the traveling back and forth was getting to be a lot. Um, and he called them for me, and he spoke with them, and they were looking for somebody. And I would say that was my, that was my end of my freshman year. Uh, so sorry, sophomore year, by beginning of my sophomore year, he got in touch with them. I went and interviewed with them and ended up working for uh, George Germon and Joanne Colleen at El Forno in Rhode Island. So I would be going to school for pastry. But then my job for all the time that I was in school was doing culinary because I thought it was important to learn both aspects. Wow, that's a great restaurant. What an opportunity that must have been. Yeah, it was fit. I, I have to say, and I hope I don't piss anybody off, <laughs> that it, it was my favorite place to work uh -huh. was Al Forno's in Rhode Island. Awesome. Yeah. Miss it greatly. Now, going back to culinary school, did you look at any other schools or you just Johnson & Wales, once you did that weekend fly-in, check it all out, orientation, that was it? You just enrolled? No, I'd also looked into CIA, but actually at that point, they didn't have a pastry program. The pastry program didn't start there until a year after I had started culinary school. I also needed 200 hours worth of working in a restaurant, which I did not have. So those two right there kind of excluded me from it because I really wanted to pursue pastry. And so then I decided on Johnson & Wales. 
Right. I think they still do a version of that fly in. Maybe you could tell the listeners what that was like. What what do you do? I mean, they're kind of giving you a little taste or pulling mm-hmm. back the curtain of what it's like, but maybe you could explain it a little bit more detail. Sure. It was it was really a great weekend. It's it's kind of just like your first day of, of school. You went to the dorms, you stayed in the dorms, you you went up, you had people that you stayed with for those three days and those those nights. Um and you stayed in the dorm and then you just went to classes just to kind of observe. And they took you all around campus, um, explained everything to you, where everything was, what they did, how they did it. It was really very, very informative. And I just, I really liked the approach and how they were doing everything. So I, I knew I was going to be hooked. <laughs> That's great. So any listeners out there looking at different schools, I'm sure they all have some type of orientation where you get to go, mm-hmm. you know, like test drive the car before you make Absolutely. that Absolutely. It's a huge, yes, it's a huge commitment and you're committing yourself and you're dedicating yourself to the craft. And I think it's very, very important just not to look and see what's on the internet or on social media at, at all. You need to go and get the feel of it. And I think that's probably what my my thing was. I needed to get the feel of it, what the sounds were like, what the smells were like, what was everybody else doing and thinking, what was everybody else's background and where they were coming from? Because I did not necessarily come from that type of a, of a background at all. Um, so it, it was the perfect opportunity. And, and I'm very, very happy that I did it. Then you got to meet some of your, your schoolmates <laughs> who did yeah, end up going. And, s- and meet the instructors. The yes, chef instructors, absolutely. And, and kind of gauge if you're, you know, this is for you mm-hmm. or for not. Or that kind of right, right. Absolutely. And and also understanding a little bit how militant it was as well. <laughs> oh. <laughs> was it like what later on the real school was like? Or did they try to, you know, make it nicer during that weekend? And then you were like, ah, oh, this is now that I've enrolled or or was it the same? Um, I would say that it was a little bit of the same. And I, I didn't want to get, you know, wherever I, I would have, you know, place I would have looked at. I didn't want to get disillusioned by what was being presented to me. I wanted to to dig a little deeper, you know, to, to see. So what a couple of friends of mine who actually ended up did go, did end up going as well, we would talk to the students that were there, or we would talk to the, the instructors that were there. Or we would talk to just even people that were walking around, you know, what do you think of the school? And it was very, that you know, you always have to do a little bit more background work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and all the, everything was very, very positive very, very positive from uh, the reactions from everybody. But it, it was a little bit like the weekend, but, you know, you're, you're there to, to study, you know, as much as going away to college and, you know, being three and a half hours away from home as, as enticing as that might sound, you know, this is the rest of your, well, part of your life, I should say. For me, it was the rest of my life. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not dead yet, but... <laughs> So far, it's been your life. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the, the learning curve, the academic rigor. Uh, what was it like once you got there? I would say for for me, it was like constantly being absorbing so much on a daily basis. And I absolutely loved it. Um because I was actually working for the school at one point, um, you know, to pay back student loans, basically. So I was actually working in the gym. Um, other than, than that, everything was just school, school, school. And I looked at even my job later on working out of Fornos at the same, still just absorbing and, and learning a whole lot. So even though there was a little bit of a curve, but um, I just, I had my heart so much in it. It really, really was was not that that bad. Mm-hmm. Um, it was really great to, you know, have that sense of independence. You know, I'm, I'm responsible for myself, you know, mean what you say and say what you mean, and, you know, right. <laughs> which always carries on. Um, but it, it was a, a little bit of a learning curve, but for me, not not that, that bad. And for some people, it, it is a little bit more difficult, and I understand that. Um, but for me, it was it was fine. I really had a, a great time and met a lot of wonder, wonderful people, a ton. Now, where you, where you went was a university, so mm-hmm. obviously there's academics where some you know culinary school programs are more just on the craft. Mm-hmm. So how was that? I mean, you had to take those academic classes, mm-hmm. even the lab classes. What was the assignments like? The homework? I mean, was it was it challenging? Was it tough? Was it easy? <laughs> it was. I mean, we didn't have com- we didn't really have computers back then, <laughs> so yeah, like the word processor. So, you know, you, you just you had to had to stay diligent. You really couldn't far behind fall behind. Just like when you were in, in high school. Mm-hmm. You, you don't fall behind on things. You keep up on things. And and being that this was something that I really wanted to do and I really loved very, very much and could see a super wide spectrum of, of what it could eventually become. Um, 
I really did my due my due diligence. The instructors were fantastic. Um, you know, we were broken up either individually or into groups. Um, you know, this the things that that we were learning that the instructors from all over. I think the, the bread class was absolutely fantastic. Um, I don't. I can't even remember one one class that I just did not like. They were hard. Some of them were definitely harder than others. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, everything was really was was good. Great. And so you have assessments in the academic classes. You have your finals and midterms. Tell us about the assessments in the labs, <laughs> what are the practical exams. Tell us about those. Oh, man. I, the, the one that I could remember specifically was when we had to practice our piping. And we had those super long 16-foot, you know, um, wooden tables that were probably about f- at least four feet wide or so. And we had to do all intricate designs. We had to do 12 lines all the way up and up and down. And I remember at that point, and, and, and I have not done this for a long time, and I hope my mother doesn't see this, that I used to smoke cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> so I would go and I would do a line and I would finish and I would be at the end and I'd go outside and I smoke a cigarette and then I would go back in and then do another. I mean, because you're, you're hunched over and you're so close. And it was that was the most stressful thing to me. Absolutely the most stressful thing. And, and to this day, I don't like to do it. I don't like those intricate, you know, um, royal icing that you have to pipe onto cakes. I still don't. I, the, that left such, such an impression on me. I teach somebody else to do it and then they can do yeah. it for me. <laughs> That's nice when you're the boss. <laughs> yeah. well, it's definitely a craft. Man. It is. It is. Cake decorating in general. That's a whole, that's a, a very specific skill set. <laughs> yeah. I, that was the... Classical cakes was the lowest grade <sighs> I ever got when I was in culinary school. Right, yes. I was at Newberry College mm-hmm. in Boston. And I had okay, a, okay. A, a big German female chef. Mm-hmm. She used to wear the checks, but they were in a dress. They weren't pants. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and, she, and I was doing not as good as I should have. I wasn't really into it because mm-hmm. I was culinary, but we had to take that. Mm-hmm. And one day she sure. said, you know, you could do so much better and get better grades if you just apply yourself. Oh, and how many yeah. times have we all? Yeah. <laughs> In my like, mind, you know. I'm like, I'm going to be an executive chef and I'm going to hire a pastry chef. So I'm not exactly. doing any of this. Exactly. <laughs> but I think I got a C plus. That was the lowest grade. In there. I probably could have got an A, but I didn't apply it. So it's just too hard. But now when you see other people doing it, you feel for them now because you yeah. understand because you've been through it. <laughs> yeah. When I hire a pastry chef, I am very like, yes, yes. <laughs> I can't do those things. Okay. So what was... um. What would you have done differently in school now with the perspective of looking back? So you went through it. If you could give your, go back and give yourself some advice for day one, would mm. you have changed anything? I think maybe what I would have done is I would have gotten involved with, at least in my first year before I started working after, after class, I would have definitely have gotten more involved in the extracurricular things. Um, there was a cake decorating club, which I obviously stayed away from, which I probably shouldn't have, but I did. <laughs> Yeah. There was, you know, the bread club. There was all different types of clubs. Um, and in, in retrospect, I wish that I would have taken the time to uh, get involved in a couple of more of those. Um, but I do have to say that my roommates at the time were involved in some of those. So I did get some of the feedback of what they were doing. And if there was any questions about anything, you know, we definitely fed off of each other a lot, which was really awesome. Um, but that's the one thing I would have done, gotten a little a little bit more involved in, in those things, because those things can lead to different types of competitions, you know, which can be national, international, local. You know, they, I think I, I definitely would have gotten more involved in those. Yeah. And was that just because of the time? You just didn't have the time in your schedule because of the work? Um, it, no, I honestly, at first I was just so excited to be away from home and I was really just wanted to concentrate on my studies that that's all that I really wanted to do was just, you know, kind of one step at a time. And once I had that first year underneath my belt, that's when I, you know, I felt comfortable enough to go and, and, and get a job and, and, and work for George and Joe. And maybe tell the listeners something about the, the life on campus outside of the academics. Cause you were there, you were in the dorms, you had roommates, mm-hmm. you know, what was that like? Any stories? <laughs> <laughs> That you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> so not the one pulling the keg up the side of the dorm. Um, um, <laughs> I mean, people want to know what it's like. They're like, well, I'm not also be living there. So obviously college life. Yeah. Well, what's it like there? I mean, you talked about clubs, there's extracurricular, there's sports, mm-hmm. there's the gym. Yes. Anything that stands out to you that you can remember? 
there 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 really is uh it's funny like there's there's so much and then it comes flooding back and then i have to like reel myself in well can i say that um i would say i, I was really i don't want to don't know if i want to say the word surprise but it was really great just how well everybody got along how supportive everybody was of of each other how any type of, you know, it didn't matter. And I think that it's across the board working in the restaurant business, how people are just so accepting and helpful and uh, stick around. Um, it's that hospitality background, right? We're hospitable. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's a great way to put it. Absolutely. Very, very hospitable. You know, and everybody, you know, realized that everybody was in it. It's just, it just in it. Everybody was just in it together, working together. And um, now, were all the majors mixed in the dorms, or was it no. just culinary and business? And business was in another area, uh, but where I was, yes, the dorm was uh, culinary and pastries. So, oh, so that's great. So you were like minded. Yes, you know, some pe- and it was great too because not everybody was going to class at the same time and leaving at the same time. You would have, you know, my couple of my roommates. Were cul- two of my roommates were culinary, myself and the other girl were, were pastry. So culinary would get up at f- five o'clock in the morning to be uh, in, in class by six. So, you know, you had to learn to how to respect everybody else's time, what everybody else was going through. And then, and then you had AM, PM, and then another one called PPM. And that one generally, if I'm not mistaken, started at about six. So, you you know, you learn to respect people's space and people's time and what everybody's going through, which was, you know, a, a great learning experience as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was really wonderful. Okay. So now you you got your degree. What did you do next? Where did you go? What did it take you to? Was it did it give you a feather in your hat when you were out there looking for jobs? It it, it did, um, and I think working with George and Joe really helped. You know, with that a whole lot. Um, the one wonderful thing where I had met a lot of people is that we actually did Julia Child's 80th birthday party, and George and Joe were very close to her, so she had come to the restaurant a couple times. So. I remember because I work garmage and I remember looking up a couple times and she would be standing right there. I'd be like, oh, my God, I worked up at one time. It was really cool. Till I looked up like Diana Ross was standing there. I was like, wow. <laughs> so working with George and Joe really opened up all the doors to me. And um, as far as the, you know, the, the, the level of that type of, of eating and, um, you know, just really appreciating where things are from and, um, we're working with farmers. It's the first time, you know, nobody really worked with farmers per se at that, at that time. Um, so learning all of that and moving forward, um, I, I wanted to stay. I didn't want to leave Rhode Island. I wanted to stay working with, with George and Joe at um, Al Forno and uh, ended up, I needed to come home. Um, and then at that time, oh my goodness, where, where was I? I went back and worked at the High Lawn Pavilion for a little while. Um, and then a restaurant by the name of uh, Asia with uh, a chef by the name of Gary Robbins had opened up in the city. And uh, I started working there um, and then started working at Time Cafe um, and overseeing all of their restaurants when they were all open. Uh, there was three of those. And then after that, ended up working again with George and Joe and moving back up to Boston and working at Cafe Louis in the Louis of Boston building, which was absolutely amazing if i'm not mistaken i think it was actually the first museum in the united states wow. so that was that was pretty pretty cool and you know it's it's not just you know i think when you get to work in in, in certain in certain restaurants you know you just get to see all sorts of different things and i mean that by working at cafe louis is that it was uh, actually at that point it was a beautiful cafe in the back of this very exclusive department store. And I remember there was a few times where I needed to get something or other and walking like down into like the, the caverns of this like museum um, that was now a department store. And the gentleman would be making, you know, these older older gentlemen would be making suits. Never seen as anybody, you know, hand make a suit. So that was, that was pretty cool. I would hang out with them every once in a while. I mean, older gentlemen, I don't even know what language they were speaking at that point. Um, but it's interesting where, you know, working in restaurants can take you in the different things that you see. Uh, but yeah, I, I really, I really enjoyed it. You know, my time there. You have some great experience, different places. Now, were you pastry in those jobs or were you some culinary, some pastry? Well, f- finally, when I was at Cafe Louis, George and Joe had me do pastry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> After I had been working for them for years, 
as on a garmage and, and then eventually moving to the line. Um, yes, I was able to be their pastry chef at, at Cafe Louis. But prior to that, it was uh, when I was at the High Lawn Pavilion, it was the I was the pastry sous chef. Now, you also worked at Oceana. How was that? Yeah. Oh, that was fantastic. What a, what a great group of, of people there. Yeah, I, I still stay in touch with many of them. Mm-hmm. Um, that was hard. That was, you know, and I do have to say anytime, you know, it doesn't matter your level or, or who you are, having to do a tasting is just daunting. And I've stayed up for hours and, and I've cried and I've gotten mad and I've thrown things. And I mean, I could see some of my cookbook collection back here, but just practically going through them and trying to come up with a menu. And, and the one, I had done one for Gramercy Tavern, um, and that one was was really difficult. Um, and then I had done the one for Oceana. That was one of my other more difficult ones in my life that I have done. And this is part of the application. Absolutely, the yes, the yes. Process? So you, you you know you send your resume. I had had a repertoire with with the chef at um, at Oceana for some time, so we knew each other, but never worked with each other professionally. Um, I had worked with him. Um, I'm sorry. No, my, my, my mother had worked with his mother. That's how long I've known Ben for, for a very long time. Um, But then, you know, it's, it doesn't, but it, at the end, it doesn't matter. It it was nice to be able to get my resume in, but at the end of the day, my food had to speak for itself because it was just because Ben was my friend. I had three other people, the owners and the general man, two of the owners and the general manager and Ben himself trying it. So, you know, at that point, that stuff absolutely goes out the window and you should never think just because you know somebody that you're going to get anything by any stretch of the imagination. Um, But yeah, that one was, was a a tough one. And I think I was sweating the entire time and, you know, shaking when I was (laughs) delivering the the plate to the table, which I'm never going to work front of the house because of it. I can carry two things like that's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's a whole other skill set. Um, but yes, going going through the tastings and the one specifically for Oceana was difficult. Besides, there was one one time that I had done and I mistook. They actually had a bin of salt next to the bin of sugar and I didn't know and they weren't marked. <laughs> <laughs> but thank God I did get to redo that tasting and I did get that job. That was at Rue 57 in, in, New, in Manhattan. Uh, but yeah, the one at Oceana, that was that was difficult. I mean, it's all white cloth. Now they let you pick whatever you want mm-hmm. for the menu. And then what do you do? You send them a list and they purchase the items for you in advance? Uh, yes, that's generally how it goes. They will give you some guy. I usually ask them for some guidelines, how many people are tasting. Usually the questions that I ask first to, to be preemptive um, once that, that is, you know, if it's not sent in an email initially, you know, yes, we would like for you to come and do a tasting. It's going to be for X many people, these things. Um, if they don't say that to me first, definitely I am preemptive about saying, okay, what day of the week, um, how many days can I get in for? Some pl- some places do allow you to do things at home and then bring in some of them. Um, some places want you to do everything right there. Um, so, yes, those are good questions to ask. Uh, how many people are doing it? Allergies as well. Yeah. It's really important. And it's a new kitchen. It's a new mm-hmm. space. What kind of equipment do they have? Do you going to have a helper? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. You need to know those things. I always tell the students when uh, when I'm doing a practical exam for a lab class, same mm-hmm. thing. They're presenting the food to me and I'm critiquing it and giving an evaluation. Yeah. I go, this never goes away. You'll do this throughout your career as part of your- You constantly have to prove yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You're only as good as your last meal. So you're always- It's true. And that's the one thing that leaves the, the, the last impression. Absolutely. Great. So that might help some listeners know that what the process is, even when you get out of school, was part of your employment, you know, the package, the selling yourself and getting those mm-hmm. jobs you know it's your, it's your skill the craft yeah absolutely absolutely even from the initial interview when you know even when i was teaching over in, in vietnam speaking to the kids about how to speak during an interview and things to say and and, and not to say and how your words really matter and and um you know the one thing that just comes out in, in my head very much. So it's one thing that I had always said to them, what I had said earlier, say what you mean and mean what you say. And if, you know, a very common thing that uh, an employer will ask you is, well, what are your weaknesses? And that's the one thing that I always try to emphasize is you never say, well, my weaknesses are, you never have weaknesses. You have things that you need to improve on. And how you present yourself and also getting there early and making sure you have everything, having a pen, having your tools, ask them what tools you need to bring. If there are tools there that you can borrow, which you generally 
don't, you want to ask, but you also don't want to ask too much because you don't want to seem like you're too needy. Right. You want to come prepared. And also another th key thing to ask is one thing that I've always done in my kitchens whenever I've been interviewing anybody to work. Um, you know, it's not always just the chef's or the person who's in charge's decision. How I've always run, you know, my department is it's also we're 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 a family. You know, you have the bigger family of the restaurant, but you also, you know, break down front of the house, back of the house, savory pastry, um, that you they're gonna be working with them too. Mm -hmm. So I would make sure that my sous chef would always be available and whoever, you know, the strong second and third person behind them would be, and just watch. And then we would talk about it. And then we would have somebody come in once, if, if not definitely twice was always a good thing. But, you know, because one person can't catch everything all the time. So even though you might, you know, the chef might not be around while you're doing something, you're going to be watched by the other people because the other people have to work with you too. So, it's, you know, you they have to be a fit for you, but you also need to be a fit for them. That's a great point because that happens to me as well. You know, whoever they give you as an assistant after the meal's done, they ask them, what were they like in the kitchen when nobody yep. was looking? How are they, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. How are they handling? And we, yes. I do that as an employer. We actually do yep. that at the school when we hire mm -hmm. new instructors and faculty. Yes. We might give them an assistant to help them and then we'll ask them, what were they like in there? Were they prepared? Did they have their mm -hmm. mise en place? Were they nervous? Did they, yep. what was their, you know, demeanor? So mm -hmm. that's a key for anyone listening. You know, when you do these things, you're on display, you're on that job interview from the day you, you know, the minute you walk in to everyone right. that you encounter. Absolutely. And then also equally, when you are going for, if you do have a tasting, always have extra recipes with you, either in your phone or written down because anything can happen. You know, they can say they're getting chocolate in, you know, 64% and then all of a sudden they only have 70. You know, maybe they meant to get um, buttermilk in, but they only got milk in. Well, how do you make a buttermilk real quick? So, you know, knowing these things is good to learn and being able to be flexible because even when you're out on the day to day work on that line, you need to be flexible. So true. And sometimes they do it on purpose, you know, to see how they yeah. react. <laughs> I'm laughing because I've done that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, let's see how they deal with this little wrench in the system here. Right. Let's see if their head blows up. <laughs> <laughs> or like, I can't do it now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so tell us about Vietnam because. You know, culinary school, a lot of people don't realize, opens so many doors, you know, when you're in this business. I mean, oh there's so God. many avenues you can go to. You can travel. There's different parts yeah. of the industry. And Vietnam was a huge one. Tell us about that. Oh, yeah. So while I was working at the, the Red Cat in the Harrison, um, there had been a, a friend of mine, a chef friend, uh, Anita Lowe. She had had Anissa in, in Manhattan for many, many years, and she's an amazing chef, um, and, a, and a, I'm grateful to have her as a friend. And she had told me about this one organization called Streets International. And turns out that I had asked our PR company for the Red Cat and the Harrison about them. And he said, yeah, he goes, actually, we represent them. <laughs> I said, you have to be kidding me? Like, how random is that? And... Um, Phil Baltz, who owns the company, he said, you know, if, if you want, he said they're having uh, a fundraiser here because they're actually correlated to one of the schools in Manhattan, ICE. Um, he said, and just go and, and see what happens. And I said, okay, absolutely fine. So I went to this event and it was wonderful. Just happened to be talking to Anita later later on in that evening. And she said, well, you know, being that Neil is here, she said, I can, I can have you have an interview with him. I was like, you have to be kidding me. I said, that'd be absolutely fantastic. And so I had a three-hour, very casual in interview with him. We sat at Sullivan Street ba Bakery, had tea. I had tea and <laughs> ate a whole lot of pastries. And we had a, a really great repertoire. Now, it had taken, it ultimately took five years for me to get there because I couldn't just get up and go to right, just pack up and leave <laughs> Vietnam. Yeah, exactly. Uh, as wonderful as that might sound, you know, when you realize that you have responsibilities like bills and mm -hmm. family and things that just happen. Um, and I wouldn't have had a job to come back to, you know, in, in our field, it's, it's tough. You know, there's been three months I've worked three months in a row. I've worked 120 hour work weeks. I've sl slept, slept on banquettes. Um, I've slept on the floor. You know, you gotta love Thanksgiving and Christmas. You know? <laughs> um, and it took five years for me to get there. So once I had finished working at uh, the Red Cat and the Harrison, 
ultimately moving forward, moving forward, I went to Oceana, became the corporate pastry chef for the McNally Group, um, which was like Baldazar, Augustine, Mineta Tavern, all of them. And once I had left there, I actually had to have my gallbladder removed. And <laughs> during that time, yeah, well, that's what happens when you, you delete a lot of crap for 30 years, you know? <laughs> I mean, oh, no, another souffle today. Time to change the filter. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Like, oh, whoa, me, another souffle. And, oh, God, another calamari. (laughs) You know, know, that catches up to you after a while. (laughs) You know, eating one, two, three o'clock in the morning, foie gras at 4 (laughs) a.m. Over a trash can. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Sitting on top of a milk crate. Exactly. (laughs) That's another thing, too. This when you really get into it as glamorous as this is it's not so glamorous <laughs> not what you see on tv is not what not in the back of the house <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> um where were we going with this <laughs> so you're gone to, you're on your way to vietnam oh vietnam right um and so during that time, it, it, Neil would reach out to me every six, seven months or so. Hey, just checking in and see when you're coming. Kind of as like a poke, poke, ha ha, when you're coming. Right. So he wrote me this one time and I said, well, actually, I can. <laughs> and he wrote me back. He's like, you're kidding me. And I said, no, I was on a plane a month later. Wow. And it was absolutely fantastic. And I had that was actually my first time working in a, in a school before that. Um you know, kind of what got me there was so, and this is quite a few years back um, when I was working one day at the Harrison, I remember it it was in the summertime. It was because it was around seven o'clock and it was still light outside. I had just come from the upstairs dining area into my, into my area. And all of a sudden the manager follows me behind. I could see that he's very flustered. I was like, what happened? Cause I, and I had seen in, in my peripheral that he had been talking to a customer And he came downstairs and said to me that this one customer, uh, that she had really torn him a new one for a a good 10 minutes on why her dessert took seven minutes, seven minutes to get to the table. I said, okay. (laughs) And, you know, I kind of sat there for a moment. You know, at this point, I had been doing it for at least a good 25 years. And I was like, you know, I think I'm, I'm ready to make a shift. I think I'm ready to get into something that, you know, people want, want to learn, um, give back, you know, per se, because I think as chefs or even, you know, people in any type of a, of, of a management position in, in general, you're going to be teaching others. Mm-hmm. Um, although at that point, I had never really looked at it in that aspect. And at that point, that's really when I, I started to get into my head thinking about, okay, what's the next step going to be? Because to have a woman... <laughs> really lambaste the general manager in a dining room in front of everybody else because your dessert took seven minutes to come out. A, that's not the real problem with what's going on. Right. She had other issues. Right. But what kind of a person is that? I know. And I was like, you know, even at Oceana, there was some terrible customers and there are just terrible customers out there. Mm -hmm. You know, wherever I've gone, I have actually stood there and listened to the wait staff come back and tell me stories and I've apologized. Like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. How could, you know, people can be awful. People mm-hmm. can be awful. And really, people cheat the fun of the house really terribly. And they're, they're, they're how they're spoken to. It's just disgusting. And I really think you can find out a lot about a person just by how they treat staff. Um, and it's really unbelievable how some people do. And at that point, I was really thinking about what to do. So fast forward. <laughs> Vietnam came about. And so I figured I'd give it a, I'd give it a shot. I mean, what am I going to, I've, I had nothing to lose, you know, just give it a shot. Now, what were you doing there? You were teaching, you said? I was. So the, the uh, school is called Streets International. And what they do, and this was something that was very, very important to me and is still very important to me, to be teaching students from extremely impoverished communities. Um, and they completely 100% changed these students' lives. They are amazing. I know, I think they taught me more than I taught them. Mm. Um, just... You know, you have to be accepted into the program. Of course, it's free. They're given a place to stay. They're given meals. They're given um, what, you know, a uniform to wear. Everything else is, everything is 100% free. Hundreds and hundreds from, of students or uh, kids, I should say, from all over the country do um, apply, but only maybe about 30 of them actually get in. Mm. And I mean, these, some of these, I've gone and visited some of their homes you know, dirt floors in the middle of absolutely nowhere, um, you know, 
a lot of the remnants of the Vietnam War are still very much um, in their day to day um, and just how poor their their families are and how much my responsibility was in teaching them a proper way it, because 100% of them do get placed into uh, restaurants and hotels and such, you know, over there, which is absolutely w- wonderful. Um, they also don't speak any English. Yeah. And somebody was generous to donate a butt ton of Rosetta Stones. These kids are, t- are learning how to speak English within the first month. I wasn't even allowed to speak Vietnamese while I was there. I had to speak English to them. And just teaching them everything about how to present yourself, how to groom yourself, how to go for an interview, what to bring, what the questions were to ask. Um, I also had the opportunity. I ran their cafe, which was co- completely funded by the school as well. And also they were there to go for their practical. So there was a front of the house. There was a back of the house. I'd meet my team there five o'clock in the morning. Sometimes I get there seven, (laughs) depending (laughs) on the night before. Um, But, you know, it was a huge learning curve for me. And I have all of these, you know, what I considered these wonderful recipes to bring and to show them and to teach them the right way as well. Um, And then how nothing would work. I remember walking my first day in the cafe. I was like, You know, I shouldn't say this, but I was like, your flower, I said, I put my hands through it. It has bugs in it and how it took, I mean, you had to think about how these things are stored. You know, these things aren't stored, like how we store them over here. Sanitary conditions. Completely different. You know, and this was, you know, I, they were clean before they were cleaner after I left, (laughs) but you know, just like sugar, they, they thought they handed me the sugar one time and it was all yellow. And I was like, why is your sugar yellow? And they said, well, this is the sugar that we have, you know, and how long it took to get through the purveyor and what just plain white sugar was. And, you know, the, the apples that they get there were completely different than the apples that we get here. I mean, of course, but another thing too, is it's, it's that we got the, used to get a lot of the apples from China and the China, the apples that they would get from China wouldn't be as good as they would get them from other places, but you can't get them from other places because they're too expensive. And the butter was from, was from Australia and how different that was and how different it worked in my recipe. So I would say the first month was just me being a complete failure and none of my recipes working out and nothing rising and i couldn't understand what was going on so it was a huge learning curve now i have a, a little a book like this with all vietnamese recipes in it that i don't use here because it won't, it won't, work. It won't work but it was a huge learning curve and you know it, it, it was infuriating and it was frustrating but you know the team that i had working at the cafe with me was absolutely wonderful and also the school in general offers something um, called oodles of noodles it's a noodle tour cuz you know vietnam is extremely famous for their noodles um, and where i was in in a hoi an they have a specific cao lao noodle which was absolutely wonderful and you know just like you were saying before the opportunities that you 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 have once you can really sit back and think of how vast cooking is it, it just really, really wonderful. Really, really wonderful. And I learned a ton about their food and culture. It sounds like a great program. How could someone find out about it if they wanted to help or donate or get involved? Sure. No, you go uh, streetsinternational.com. Actually, I think I have the book is right behind me. Where is it? Yeah. <laughs> it's right here. <laughs> All right. Good food helping good kids. Wow. It's really fantastic. And actually, while I was there, they won um, a CNN award for for helping. It was really wonderful. And they had you know, this camera crew come in. I mean, this camera, here I am with the students and we're, you know, we're doing our thing and we're really happy. And you're talking to these the CNN reporter with these two cameramen and they've gotten like dropped off in the middle of war zones and they've gone through like international coups and, and all of these things. And you're like, I make bread, you know. <laughs> so it was a little intimidating, but you know, they yeah. they didn't present themselves as such whatsoever. But it was just really, really interesting. Um, so that was something that was cool. I'll put that link in the show notes too. So if anyone's listening and wants to get involved to find out more about it, they can. Yeah, because I I still speak to them, and what's going on over there right now is just absolutely unbelievable. Now you mentioned you're talking about books there. I happen to have a book from Dirt Candy, and I see oh. about you went th- you worked there. So tell me about yes. that. So when I had gotten back from from um, from Vietnam, I'm trying to see how did how did this all work out. 
Oh, sure. Okay. So um, Amanda is a good friend of mine and she had sent out a mass email in this one. She was going on Iron Chef because she's Canadian when she was going on Iron Chef Canada and she had sent out a mass email saying, Hey, you know, I'm going away. You know, she couldn't tell us what it was for a little while. I need somebody to, to possibly help out in her position to help her sous chef and stuff out. She's like, but I'm also looking for a pastry chef. And this was probably about a month after I had gotten home. Um, she said, if anybody knows anybody, can you please just let me know? And I wrote her back and I said, I can. <laughs> and she wrote me back. She, she, yeah, she texted me. She's like, you're kidding me. She's like, you know, I couldn't pay you X amount. It's only going to be for about six weeks or so. I said, that's fine. It's better than sitting and doing nothing. I said, you know, and, and for me, I said, you know, I said to her as well, you know, I don't know that much about and it's beyond vegetarian cooking. I mean, her stuff is amazing. And she's Oh, it's the cookbook's amazing. Just re- looking at it and reading it and Hey man, her food's really good. <laughs> really, really good. I hope to get there someday. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Let me know. <laughs> okay. And uh and I said, you know, as long as you wouldn't mind or your pastry chef wouldn't mind you know, really tutoring me for a little bit before you go. And she said, absolutely. So her pastry chef, Shannon, who's absolutely amazing, taught me everything that they do there. And and it's funny that, you know, you think it's a vegetarian restaurant. So pastries would probably have some fruits in it. No, very, very minimal, minimal, minimal fruit. If any fruit, even on the pastry, everything is all vegetables. Hmm. And it's a tight, tight quarters. And it's absolutely wonderful that her staff is fantastic. I remember I had a day off and I, I went to the beach and I ended up, I get, I got poison ivy. So I had to work for two weeks with like this <laughs> oozing poison ivy and it's hot in there and, you know, slapping cornstarch on it just to, you know, <laughs> try to absorb all this glue that was coming out of my leg. <laughs> But I learned a whole lot there. And so one of the things was when after Amanda had gotten back, she had uh, told me about an, an opportunity uh, at NYU because she actually had worked in that program, being an adjunct there, teaching the students um, the, the lab end of it. So it's mostly students who are going, not inclusively, but a lot of students who are going for their master's degree in food and nutrition. And she said, they're looking for somebody to teach culinary. She's like, do you want to talk to them? So I did. Then you know, I said, to, I would talk to this woman by the name of Lourdes Castro. She's actually she's in Miami right now. <laughs> yeah. She's absolutely wonderful. She's a certified nutritionist. She's been running the program for some time. And so, you know, I said to her, you know, I have no problem. I said, but I've never taught culinary before. You know, I've been a pastry chef for a really long time. And even though I was in Vietnam teaching, I said it, I was running a cafe. So it was all of, you know, the, all of the, the pastries, you know, going out for, to the um, hotels and, and the local things. I mean, my first meats class, <laughs> me and my TA, I was like, and I'm a vegetarian. So the vegetarian pastry chef is trying to teach a class on red meat. <laughs> I mean, it, it has it has nothing to do with save the animals, which I'm all for save the animals. But I just I just never had the taste for it. And that's all that is. You know, if you can eat your red meat. I like to wear a leather jacket. You know, <laughs> I like <Yeah>. leather shoes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she taught me a lot. Now I know how to poach an egg properly and <laughs> I know how to identify all the meats and, and it's, it's been a learning process for, for, for me, but it was absolutely wonderful. And I'm so happy to be there. And it's also strange how things have transitioned from me working in a restaurant, going to Vietnam, teaching, coming back and now teaching at NYU, especially with what's going on in the world right now. And so I'm very, very grateful. Hmm. So you're teaching, you're teaching there n- now, mm-hmm. or you're just yep. in between terms or something. How do you like the teaching? Is it how is it different, and how are the students compared to students, you know, in the back in the day? And has things changed in the world of education? Um, <laughs> you sure you want to go there? <laughs> um, so the students at NYU, um, they're they're great. They're they. Because they're not students that are going into the culinary field, they ask a lot more interesting questions than I would ever think. Mm-hmm. Um, they've also corrected me a few times. As, as per the red meat class, I had said to them, you know, you have to make sure that in between cutting the, the meats on your board, you have to make sure you have to disinfect, bleach, and clean down your board just to make sure you get all the blood off. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm also quickly corrected that it's actually not blood, that's actually hemoglobin. And I'm like, man, come on. You know, like, you know what I meant. You know what I meant. <laughs> but say what you mean, mean what you say. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they have also been very particular with me. And I also find I also love how you have these students that, that 
are learning how to cook. And I've had so many come up to me, have not even held a knife before. So t- to watch them unfold and, and be confident. And as I'm sure as many you know students know that people who don't usually use knives often are very, very afraid of knives dropping. I mean, you should always be afraid of a dropping knife. Remember, always let it fall. <laughs> don't ever try to catch it. Yeah. Um, but their their way of looking at it was from a more nutritional scientific point mm-hmm. of view. And I treat them differently than students that I have um, taught going into to a, the culinary field. Um, I also had done um, a stint for a couple months before all of this in the world happened last March, um, also working with Columbia University. And they have like an, an umbrella part of their university that teaches um, um Students and it's not just students; any any age group. Um, again, it's almost like going to culinary school, but it's not really accredited. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I'm a lot harder on them and speak to them differently than the kids at NYU because they don't they're not going into the field, so I don't have to be as hard on them. Right, right. I mean, they still need to do things, and they still are, are graded. And you know, I've I I failed a couple. You know, if you you're not doing it right, you're not doing it right. You know, just like anything else, even when you go to culinary school, you right. got to do the work. <laughs> yeah, do the work, do the learning. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so yes, I do teach at, at NYU a little bit a little bit differently than those who are going into the, the actual field. But at the same token, being that this is all that I've been doing for you know a good portion of my life, I kind of treat them and I tell them from the get-go. I come from a restaurant and I work in a kitchen. I'm going to treat you <laughs> like we're working in the kitchen. And I do have to say that I think that they kind of a little a little bit appreciate it. You know, every once in a while, I'll, I'll sneak up to them and I'll look inside what they're doing. I'll be like, what the hell are you doing over there? Yeah. And they'll be like, ah! Because, you, know? <laughs> you know, you're not supposed to swear, but I'll be like, WTF, like, come on! Like, you know, so I treat them like I'm goofing around with them, like working in the kitchen, because that's just what I, I know how to do. Mm-hmm. But I also do give them a little bit of, of the, you know, the freedom to, you know, goof around amongst themselves, you know, because it, it is it is food. It, it, it yeah. you know, once you're working in the industry and I'm sure you've heard this a million times, you know, with somebody's getting so upset over somebody and you're like, it's just food <laughs> yeah. with how seriously we all really, really take it to the heart. And I want to know where it's coming from, how it's grown. I've I've even gone as far as for many years you know, looking at weather patterns, you know, what, when is a frost coming in Florida? What's that going to do with my orange juice? What do you mean that, you know, that there's an, an outbreak with something in the spinach? You know, don't tell me that the coconut grove got burned to the ground. You know? <laughs> so there's a lot more than just, you know, calling your purveyor up. So what's next for you? Are you going to continue on this teaching path or is, you know, where, where's you, where's you see yourself in a year, five years? Oh, uh, that's a tough one. I have to, I have to be honest. I've been struggling. I've been really, really struggling. Um, since I came back from, from Vietnam predominantly with, with what I'm going to do, but also with, you know, you know, you have your body for only a certain amount of time. And I've had planters of fasciitis in both feet for well over 10 years now. You know, even what I was telling you, working 120 hours a week, three months without a day off, mm-hmm. you know, or, or even sometimes, you know, a month longer. Um, it takes a, a, a toll. It really takes a toll. You miss weddings, you miss funerals, you miss weekends, you miss birthdays. You know, you are the person behind all of that. Yeah. And I think I'm at a point right now where I'm even saying to myself, okay, what's, what's next? I miss being in a kitchen. Oh God, I miss being a kitchen so much. I miss the camaraderie. I, I miss the, the, the family feeling of it. You know, I mean, everything from, you know, a, a friend's house burning down and the whole entire restaurant comes together and just gives, you know, you know, just rallies, you know, that's, what's really great about restaurant people. We really rally together. We really stick it together. We really go through those trenches, you know, when you you work your, your game faces on, but you know, there's never anything that happens so bad in a restaurant that can't be discussed and settled over a beer afterwards. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Move on to the next day. Exactly. <laughs> next this too shall pass. <laughs> I do really enjoy teaching and I do love teaching at NYU. Um, and I think now it's something that I, that I'm going to try to continue with. I just can't do the 12, 15 hours in a restaurant anymore. My body just can't do it. Yeah. You know, it just can't do it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and I have to say, if I'm not mistaken, I think, you know, a, a few years back, the average burnout age for a kitchen person was like 30, I think 30 or 35, you know, I made it to like, you know, 47, you know, so not, not bad, yeah. but I would like to get into something more that I was doing in Vietnam because that's what holds true more so to my heart is helping those who really, really need it, mm -hmm. who really want to do it for the love of it and really do it because they want to help people, not because they saw something on the Food Network, you know, and I've, I've you know, been honored to have done TV and, and radio and, and, and contributed to many cookbooks and such. But like, to me, going to another country, they just still don't have as many opportunities as we would necessarily have here. Right. And so I would like to be able to continue to do something like that, even if it's only for like a month or two a year, I would be absolutely fine with that. It just, you know, you get to a point where just you, you want to make, be able to make a difference in any small way you can. Right. We're not here for this long <laughs> on this earth. No. Well, how, how can people get in touch with you then if maybe they have an opportunity oh. or they just want to ask you about your experiences? Do you have a social media presence? Do you have some way they can get in touch with you? Something like I do. I mean, you can email me. All right. That's always a good way too. Yeah. Email email me at grapes71 at gmail.com um, or you can uh, just look for me on, on Instagram or on Facebook. I think there's only one other person with my name and I think she lives in California. I actually had somebody call me one time because, you know, Grapes is not a very normal last name. And I had this woman from California saying that their last name was Grapes as well. And maybe we, we tried to figure out if we were related, oh, yeah. but it turns out that we weren't. <laughs> also, going to wine tastings when you have a last name of Grapes is not good. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard it all. Okay. Well, I'll get those. And I'll get those from you, and I can put those in the um, oh, cool. show notes, Thank too. You. And then people, if they're listening, they can look that up and get in touch yeah. with you. Maybe there's some opportunities that they could use your expertise, mm. your skills, knowledge in some place in the world right yeah. now that you know, wants to bridge that gap with culinary or baking and food in general and mm. uh, you know, society and getting people workforce ready. Right. Absolutely. No, that would be that would be absolutely wonderful. And like you were saying before, the opportunity when you work with food, you know, everybody eats food. You'll never not have a job if you're working in the food industry or hospitality industry. Everybody's got to eat. You can move anywhere and there's going to be a job for you doing something. Absolutely. And also, I think it's a really informative to let some of the students know just if it feels uncomfortable, do it. If it feels comfortable, don't do it. Right. You know, you always want to be striving for the next level. You know, that's one thing I've always told people. Are you in over your head? And they're like, yeah, I said, absolutely fantastic. That's the job you take. <laughs> that's when you're learning. That's when you're exactly. growing. When you're exactly. When you're comfort and you, zone. Absolutely. I still take classes. I go to Valrona over here in Brooklyn and I'll still take classes every now and then. That's another thing too. There's never, you never know everything. And if you think you know everything, it's time to stop and reassess. Right. <laughs> and the other thing is uh, it's it, you don't get stuck, you know, getting stuck in a rut. I always tell my students it's like a merry-go-round. Yeah. Keep riding yes. the ride as long as it's fun. When it's not, get off and go yes. find another ride. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you always still have your ticket. <laughs> right. Move on. Life's short. <laughs> So now with all your perspective, looking back, was culinary school worth it? Was it worth all the time and the money and the effort and where you ended up? Was it worth it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and yeah, in, in retrospect, when you're, when you're in it, it's the hardest to see. But in retrospect, if anything would have changed, I would not be where I am today. And that's, you know, that's also making peace with things that you did or did not do in the past. Like I was saying to you before, I really wish I would have done some more, equi you know, extracurricular things my first year, but it just didn't work out that way. And, you know, I think you also got to give yourself a little bit of a break too, you know, giving yourself a, a break, but also really pu pushing yourself to, to go and to do. And I'm, I'm happy that I, I went away to college. I'm happy that I stayed friends with many, many of the, my fellow students, you know, all those years ago, we still talk now and still get together and see each other and still talk about old times. <laughs> um, Reminiscing. Yeah, absolutely. But definitely no, no regrets with, with how things have, have panned out. It's, it's been so far, it's, I've been blessed. I really have, which has been wonderful. And hopefully we'll continue moving forward. Oh, great. Do you want to talk about uh, a mentor or someone that influenced you or... Um, do you have anyone you want to call out for that? Or, you know, someone that maybe uh, influenced you. Do you have someone in mind or no? Or two or three or whatever? I, I have, a, you know, I'm trying to think. Uh, this say um, an overall mentor was probably when I was at Al Forno with um, George, 
George Germone and Joanne Colleen, and also uh, working with Jimmy Bradley at the Red Cat and the Harrison. Um, it was really a, even though there was a, a demand for, you know, high quality food and, and presentation and, and um, both restaurants with a lot of things in, the, in social media, it was all really, really wonderful. And especially when social media was just starting out, um, because anybody who's really my age, who's still doing this and really into it, didn't have all of those influences of social media and the Food Network and Cooking right. Channel. We really did it. Didn't exist. Exactly. <laughs> no, it didn't exist at all. You know, you know, I, I really think that the old school um, books and, and techniques, I think Jacques, you know, Jacques Pepin had said something to the ilk of, you know, you have to have your basics down first before you move to towards anything else. Um, but working with George and Joe um, really gave me the perspective of working in a restaurant and how that influences everything and everything that goes into working for a restaurant. So what that means is that she, they were very, uh, they knew the gentleman who used to get their clams, used to free dive for, for clams. He would go down and hand pick them and put the ones back that weren't large enough and, wow. you know, really take the time and how they had this one gentleman in little Compton who grew all their, their, their uh, lettuces. And one day they asked me if I wanted to go. And I had never had that experience of working with a, a farmer or talking to the farmer. Like I just work in the kitchen, but just going to the farm and, and learning how things grow. And the farmers are really the rock stars. You know, I, I hope a lot of people realize that, you know, the farmers are the rock stars. Well, Alfer Alferno was so far ahead of everybody else. You know, they were doing it when it wasn't cool. They were. Right? I mean, they were just doing it because it was the right yeah. thing to do. They were. Exactly. And I remember George kicking people out of the out of the restaurant because they wanted a steak not cooked properly, you know, because it was you were you weren't eating. the You were missing the integrity of the meat. You know, he wouldn't cook it past like medium because it just wasn't right. You know, and, and I just loved that about working there. You know how, you know, there was a time where we really we worked together well. Because we had to, and we had to get the job done, and that's where all of our heads were as far as work goes. But I remember there was a time where we didn't get along. There were certain people working in the restaurant that we didn't get along. And that's also something really important, too, is that you might not always get along with everybody, but you have to work with everybody. Right. And you might not get along with somebody out of work, but, you know, in work, they're they're amazing. You know, that was a, another talking about learning curves earlier. That was a huge learning curve for me. Um, you don't have to get along, but you have to get along. <laughs> right. Some people equate it to going into battle when you go to service. We're all here for the same oh, goal, but one hundred percent protect each other's back. Absolutely. But afterwards, we don't have to hang out. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> we be popping espresso beans, you know. <laughs> so as we wrap up our talk today, what advice or guidance would you give to someone that's thinking about going into this career industry or going into culinary school? What, what would you tell them? The advice that I would give them is to hold, to hold true to your heart. Always do what you want to do. Always do what you love. Um, go into it knowing that you're going to be working long, hard hours. It's, it's not all what you see on TV at all. Um, I would say Gordon Ramsay probably has the closest thing to what it is like lurking in a kitchen. Um, I would I would definitely say be prepared, be on time, be early. Um, always make sure that you're um, open to absolutely anything and everything. Do everything that's expected of you and beyond. You have time down. Always make sure that you ask what else you can do, what else you can prep on, um, how you can even help others. You know, you're working on the culinary side. One thing that I've always been adamant, I've always sent my pastry people over to the line, go and peel, go and peel onions, go in and, and, and shuck corn, mm -hmm. go in and learn how to devein shrimp. You know, I, th I that's go and learn more e equally. I've had the pa the culinary side come over to me, you know, ask questions, ask a lot of questions. There's never too many questions that you can ask. You know, I also think that, you know, in certain kitchens, there's like a hazing part as well. You know, don't take too much to heart, you know, be, be open, but you know, there's a lot to be said for keeping your mouth shut and keeping your eyes down, <laughs> mm, yeah. but also be open to other, other things, open to other cultures, open to, yeah, 
working in kitchens, a lot of different religions that come into play, you know, just being respectful and mindful of, of everybody in your surroundings, which is a day-to-day thing, not even necessarily in a kitchen, but also know that you're going to probably be working a lot of long, hard hours before anything really happens. I would say definitely, you know, don't just ever, you know, how you leave, how you walk into a place is how important as you leave a place. You don't want to burn, really do not want to burn any bridges. Sometimes even if you haven't been doing things correctly, how you leave a restaurant or any job for that matter really shows a lot to your character. Um, You know, go out the right way, you know, be on time, don't be on your cell phone. Um, Same for ask ask questions. How are you doing this? How can I do it differently? What can I do? Ask for, you know, somebody who's your superior, you know, can you give me an assessment after a month, after after a couple of months? Um, I do know that longevity is a very big thing. Always stay in some place at least one year. And then, you know, if you think about it, you think a year might be a long time, but you've only gone through summer once, winter once, spring once. Mm-hmm. Um, you've gone through the rush season only once. So how much can you really know? You know, always ask if if you're moving, if you're on garmage, how do you move up to saute and how do you move up to grill? You know, you become more of a valuable asset when you know how to do a little bit of, of everything, you know, be clean, be, you know, prepared, always have a pen, always make sure you have your tools, sharpen your knives. <laughs> oh my God, sharpen your knives, keep sharp knives. <laughs> And, you know, maybe even, you know, a couple of days a week, get involved with what the purveyor does, you know, depending on what type of facility you're going into. Sometimes they might let you go out, get it, you know, and after you, you know, the fish guys are coming in a couple of times, maybe you can go to the fish market early morning with them one time, you know, just really go on that, that extra, that little bit extra, keep up on what's going on in your community with the restaurants in your community um, and all across the world, you know, you know, pinpoint things like Japan, um, see what's happening over, you know, with food in Russia, see what's happening with Vietnam over in Southeast Asia, find out like where the best places in Paris are in France to go or Spain, you know, look up those, those, you know, Michelin restaurants um, and just try to get involved in that way, you know, go online and, and, you know, plug in culinary or pastry and see what pops up as far as organizations or organizations you can follow or, or be involved in. Because there's so, so much that you can do and doing it. That's what you got to do. <laughs> you just got to, you, you, you got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Great advice. So true. I have to say the first bit of advice that I ever got working in a restaurant, I was working at a time cafe in Manhattan. And I remember um, Matt, that was the chef's name. I can't remember his last, his last, his first name is Matt. But he walked up to me and he said, you know, just to let you know, he said, if you ever see a box of cornstarch in the bathroom, don't put it back into dry storage. <laughs> and I was like, why not? I was like, why would you have cornstarch? <laughs> and he's like, that's the kitchen. Just if you see cornstarch in the bathroom, leave it in there. And I was like, OK, and like inevitably, I'd always see this box of cornstarch in the in the in the bathroom. Finally, I had asked you know, one of the guys, I was like, why do you always have to have cornstarch in the bathroom? I was like, it makes no sense. He's like, it gets really hot behind the line. I was like, yeah, but oh, oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's like that movie Chef where they're using it when they're driving the food truck. Exactly. And you cornstarch I down your pants? died. <laughs> I knew it in, not intimately, but I knew what they were talking it's like about. To stop chafing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, and those old school chef pants. Oh, the polyester. How terrible. The, oh. How terrible they were. <laughs> funny. Well, that is just about all the time we have for this episode. And I want to first thank you, Colleen, for coming on the show today and sharing your culinary school story with all of us. Really appreciate your time and your honesty and your insight into your career, into your story. Thank you so much for having me. And good Lord, we could talk for hours, (laughs) hours and hours. (laughs) It's 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 a part of the journey. (laughs) Yeah. Well, thanks again. I really enjoyed our chat. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye. And a big thanks and appreciation also goes out to all of you, the listeners. We hope you enjoy the show and this episode. You all are a big part of this show, so please let us know what you think. Your comments are always welcome, and they help us in making the best show possible. You can email them to culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. That's culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. 
or even leave us a voicemail at area code 207-835-1275. That's area code 207-835-1275. And if you like the show, we have a big ask of all of you, and that is to share the podcast with everyone you know and to give us a positive rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Okay, until our next culinary school story, take care and be well. Bye-bye. Culinary School Stories is a proud member of the Food Media Network.